All right, Dr. Tom, and we're live. Okay, we're live, we're live. Hello, it's Tuesday, it's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. in London, and most of Europe, and uh, oh, oh, I've, I've got this, I've got this, I have found the way to be accurate in my timing, it's uh, uh, 4.30 a.m. in New Delhi, 11 a.m. Wednesday morning in Auckland, 9 a.m. in Brisbane, and most of Australia, and it's Facebook Live. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you. We're back home now. I'm happy to say uh, we had a, uh, a seven-week journey uh, through Europe. I did a number of talks, and we introduced Gio to his family in Italy, uh, my family, and, and then his family in Poland, Marzi's family, and everyone loved him, and, and uh, it was just a great trip overall. And, you know, it's nice to be back home, and it takes a day or two to acclimate again to time zones. And so we, uh, we woke up at four this morning. Uh, so uh, uh, Gio woke up and we woke up with them just wide awake. But here we are. And um, uh, today we're going to talk about adaptogens. And uh, I'll answer your questions. You can start typing them in. But I'm going to start with the basic concepts of adaptogens first and why they are so incredibly beneficial in a way that no other supplements are beneficial. Absolutely nothing does what adaptogens do that, that's out there. Uh, there are three requirements for an herb to qualify as an adaptogen. And we know that for every uh, one adaptogen, there's 4,000 herbs. That's how rare the adaptogens are. And some of them we've heard of, so we think they're really common because we've heard of them a lot like ginkgo and ginseng. Uh, some people have heard about maca or rhodiola. These are adaptogens that have made the news in the last um, two decades, mainly in the last 20 years or so, maybe 30 years, because so many studies come out and show how incredible they are. And the result is that um, more people are reading about them in alternative press and things like that. But there are three categories that have to be fulfilled for an herb to be an adaptogen. First, it can do no harm. Now, to be on the safe side, we always say, uh, uh, you know, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, please check with your doctor first. And that's just to be on the safe side because we don't know uh, uh, of any complications, but it's always better to be safe. Uh, but I've never heard of any indigenous people who use adaptogens that did not use them in pregnancy. I'm, I haven't studied indigenous peoples all over the world to be an expert, but we've never heard of a problem, but it's always safer. But aside from that, everyone should be able to use adaptogens and dosing might be different, but the first uh, criteria is first do no harm. Second, they are not tissue specific. Now we hear that ginkgo is good for your brain, that's true, but it's also good for your cardiovascular system and it enhances liver detoxification. And there are a number of different benefits to um, any of the adaptogens. They're not tissue specific just for one particular condition, the way that drugs are targeted for or marketed for a particular condition, but there's so many side effects uh, from drugs is because even though they're trying to target the one chemical in a plant or make a copy of a chemical in a plant uh, because of its benefits, you know, the example that I always give is sugar. Sugar, uh, what we call sugar or white sugar or table sugar, um, is actually one chemical in the plant sugar cane. Uh, and Kids in Jamaica chew sugarcane all day long. They never get cavities and it's really sweet, but they never get cavities. Why? Because all of the um, enzymes and the fiber and the nutrients are in the sugarcane, not just the sweet part, the white crystalline powder that we call sugar, sucrose. But when you extract just one component of a plant, then it gets more 
target specific, like uh, with uh, ta table sugar, the one extract, the white crystalline powder, um, targets your taste buds. And cocaine is the same way. You know, cocaine is a white crystalline powder that you extract from um, a plant. Uh, but when you chew the leaves of the whole plant, you get more than just that one compound that's in the plant. So pharmaceuticals will pull out a very powerful component of a plant, uh, or they make a chemical copy of it uh, to have a targeted effect. Adaptogens don't have targeted effects. Now we can put together adaptogens in a way that they work really well in particular systems of the body. And we'll talk about that a bit tonight. But the first point is uh, they do not target uh, specific tissue. They're more global. They're more general in how they work. The next is that um, they do no harm. They do no harm. Now you can overdose on water and we call that drowning. So you can overdose on anything, you know, but uh, uh, realistically adaptogens do no harm. And the third is that they're stabilizing. And that's a really important concept because stabilizing means if you're too high, they bring you down. If you're too low, they bring you up. They help to balance to stabilize. That's the three criteria that are commonly accepted that an herb has to meet to qualify as an adaptogen. Uh, and that's an important place to start, you know, um, is with um, uh, those three criteria so that we understand they're safe. They're safe. Um, as the questions come in, I'll just roll on over to them. What's the best for brain health to prevent Alzheimer's. And that's from an Instagram question. That's really good. And that's one of the products I wanna talk about in the next hour quite a bit is called Fog Cutter. And there's nothing out there that is as comprehensive as Fog Cutter. There are 18 herbs, uh, adaptogens in Fog Cutter. And they are just marvelous, marvelous at uh, uh, kind of, not kind of, turning the dimmer switch up uh, in your brain so that you're just, you know, you don't feel like you've had three cups of coffee. You don't feel jacked up. You just feel brighter. You know, the, the lights are brighter. I can see more clearly. You know, my vision is going a little bit. Sometimes I can't read fine print without wearing glasses. And if I don't have my glasses, what will I do? I take my phone and I turn the flashlight on to make it brighter. And then I can see a little more clearly. Uh, I, I can read the print, the small print. I don't know why, but I can. But fog cutter is that way. It's like turning the flashlight on, on your vision of the world and, and how your brain functions. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, I've told this story before. We. Um, went to the IFM conference, the Institute for Functional Medicine's annual conference of which I've been on faculty for over 10 years. And we did a booth there, uh, Sunhorse uh, did a booth there. And uh, we decided to give a complimentary bottle of fog cutter to all of the doctors. And uh, the team at Sunhorse just looked at me and said, really, really, you want, really? Uh, that's, that's a lot because there were about 900 doctors there, something like that. And th that was a big decision. But uh, because we were so confident of the results, you know, the results are when doctors try this themselves, they do an OMG, oh my God, this is remarkable. I mean, people would come back to the booth, at the first break, they come down, they just grab, they say, oh, it's this. So just give a cut, two, three pumps, and then come on back a little later, you know, we'll tell you more about it. You've only got 15 minutes on this break before the next lecture. And they come back and their eyes are like, wow, that's really amazing. You know, usually I need to wear my glasses to see the screen. I didn't have to wear my glasses. One doctor came back all excited, said, what is this? And we explained what adaptogens were. And we've got a handout on the scientific studies uh, uh, for the ingredients of fog cutter. We'll put the link in here for that handout so that you can uh, 
download it uh, and read some of the studies. And when you see medical students that take uh, some of these adaptogens during their exams and how they score so much better on their exams uh, uh, and their energy is up and their response uh, is, wow, I feel great. Uh, but you see the numbers and they're pretty, pretty impressive. So in terms of uh, uh, what's the best for brain health, uh, the first thing I would say is fog cutter. Now, the second part of that question was uh, prevent Alzheimer's. So that's a bigger, bigger question, right? Because when you want to prevent a disease, you have to identify where's the disease coming from? What's the mechanism that causes this disease? Because for those of you that have been following us for a while, you know that nobody gets Alzheimer's overnight, uh, that it's a decades long process. It goes on for at least 25 years uh, and you have no symptoms, none, but you're killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells. And then eventually you start making jokes that you're getting older. You don't remember the way you used to. And you say, well, how old are you? Well, I'm 38. <laughs> no, that's not supposed to happen. What it means is that your brain cells um, are degenerating when you're losing. Where, where did I park my car in the parking lot? Or where's my keys? Where did I put my keys? Your brain cells are going because of the amount of inflammation that's in the memory center of the brain, killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells. And that goes on for over 20 years. And it's just um, jaw dropping. You know, when you understand this, I'm gonna pull up a slide here to show you because it's such a, a uh, uh, remarkable, uh, 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 concept when you get it, when you really understand it. Uh, it's a remarkable, remarkable concept. So give me a moment here to uh, find the slides that I'm going to pull up here. Uh, here they come. Uh, and, and I'm going to need to be able to share a screen here. Uh, so I'm going to show you, uh, this really puts into perspective where adaptogens come into play. So let me first uh, 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 open up my screen. Uh, I have to find the right buttons here. Here we go, share screen. And there we are. Now let's, let's go to, here we go. And we're gonna do this. And we're gonna bring this up here so you folks can see it. And the first thing I wanna show you is that the Center for Disease Control tells us that 14 of the top 15 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. 14 out of 15, the only one that's not is unintentional injuries. They used to think suicides were not a chronic inflammatory disease, but suicides come from depression and depression is a chronic inflammatory disease. So the first thing we need to understand is that we need to stop the inflammation. That's the million dollar concept in preventing Alzheimer's is stop the inflammation. And I'm gonna show you how to do that and show you how to identify it. But first we have to understand the concept. So I love this uh, drawing because systemic chronic inflammation is the center wheel that turns that wheel to the right. And it doesn't matter if you man manifest as diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer or depression or autoimmune diseases or neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, it doesn't matter. The mechanism is the same. When you get that big picture understanding that the mechanism is the same, then you understand how important it is to live a anti-inflammatory lifestyle. If inflammation is what causes the diseases that are going to take you down, then you want to reduce the inflammation wherever you can. 
And what triggers the inflammation? All of the things on the left side of the screen from chronic infections like viruses and Lyme and bacteria, physical inactivity, obesity, uh, having the good guys be lower than the bad guys in your gut. So the balance is off and that's called dysbiosis. Uh, the foods that you eat, the most common source of uh, inflammation is what's on the end of your fork. That's most common for most of us. Uh, chronic stress, disturbed sleep, and the chemicals that we're exposed to, all of those things on the left side are what turn the wheel in the center, producing the inflammation that turns the wheel that's going to manifest wherever the weak link is in your chain. You know, you pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, it's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where the chain's going to break eventually. And what I want to do, uh, let's see, I'm looking here. Can I pull up? Oh, Marzi just walked in. Can you get Facebook on for me, please, so I can say hello to people? So um, the goal is reducing chronic inflammation. That's the goal here. So all of the neurodegenerative diseases are chronic inflammatory diseases, whether it's seizures or schizophrenia, depression, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, autism, anxiety, bipolar disorder. It doesn't matter. They're inflammation diseases and they pull on the chain of the weak link in your brain manifesting whatever symptoms you manifest. So the underlying mechanism that's causing all of this is the inflammation. So that's the first thing that we want to identify is where's the inflammation coming from? Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about the testing, but let me just tell you, we'll put the link in here to the test. The most comprehensive test is called the Neural Zoomer Plus. It looks at 53 different markers of inflammation in your brain. It's a blood test. And it's a simple blood test to do, and it's very accurate. Uh, but it'll identify, do you have inflammation in your brain right now? And it doesn't matter how you feel, because I'm going to show you the slides in a minute of how long it takes to, uh, uh, before you get symptoms of this inflammation accumulating in your brain. So I'm just going to skip a couple of slides here that I use when I'm teaching doctors about this so that I can get to the study that I want to show you. Here we go. Blue Cross Blue Shield tells us that in four years, between 2013 and 2017, the diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's went up over 200%. And the average age of these people was 49. Now that's okay. I mean, that doesn't rock anybody's boat. It's just more numbers until you realize when they broke it down during that four year period of those people 30 to 44 years old, that group, the diagnosis went up 407% in four years. Younger people are manifesting the symptoms of chronic inflammation earlier and earlier in life. Why? Because younger people are getting that inflammation so much younger than my generation did or my parents' generation. The kids are born today with a lot of excess inflammation because mom was full of the chemicals um, or the poor foods that are causing that inflammation in their body. There's a number of reasons. It's not just one reason. So I don't wanna sound fanatical, you know, say, well, because of this. No, there are a number of things. And as you study this with us, you learn all of the little pieces of the puzzle that you want to address. But a 407% increase in 30 to 44 year olds in four years in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. That's a what? What? And this is the slide that I wanted to show you. In July of 2019, Health and Human Services brought together the best scientists in the English language from all over the world to come to Washington and to study about what are we gonna do about Alzheimer's? Uh, because these numbers are very scary and it's gonna bankrupt the healthcare system. Uh, and most countries are saying 
something similar to that. Well, thank you, honey. Marzi just got me uh, uh, on, so I can see who has said hello here. So I always like to do that for a moment. So tell us where you're from uh, when, when you do that. And here, uh, Aurelia says, uh, hello, uh, Aurelia Mueller. Uh, Marianne says she's in Akron. Hello, Marianne. Shanquila uh, uh, has a question. I'll get your question, Shanquila. I'm just gonna say hello here for a minute. Marianne, I saw that today too, great question. Oh, Quicksilver, okay, then I'm gonna look at this question of Shanquila's. Quicksilver Scientific, notice it looks same and says Sunhorse proprietary use. Does it have corn? No. Uh, well, I don't know about Quicksilver's product because they put it in a liposomal form, but they take um, some of our Sunhorse products and then they add liposomes to them. Uh, uh, we've never thought uh, uh, we had to do that to make our products effective, but Quicksilver wanted to take it where they thought one step further. Uh, and a lot of people use their, their product and they like it a, not, a lot, but the Sunhorse Sun products, absolutely no corn in them whatsoever. No, the only added ingredient besides the adaptogenic herbs is grade B organic maple syrup. And uh, that's the very highest quality maple syrup, by the way, is grade B. Uh, so I uh, hope that answers the question for you, Shanquila, and for Marianne. Uh, let's see. And then we're going down. Uh, Shanquila says, what's the ethanol source? There is no ethanol in... Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shaham, there yeah. is ethanol. I just gave Justin a call, and it is from organic pure cane sugar. Oh, well, thank you. I didn't even know that. Well, that's, thank you, Ann. Thanks for that information. Good to know. Lucia is here from Tucson and she says, what do you think about pine pollen? Pine pollen has got some really good evidence that it's a useful uh, component uh, to use. Um, I don't think it's an adaptogen, uh, but it, it supports the immune system. Uh, I've used it a few times in my life and I've liked it. I found it useful. Uh, I don't see a reason why not uh, in using that. Uh, Hillary's here and says hello and is watching. Let's go back to the uh, drawing now from Health and Human Services. If you notice what they refer to as the prodromal stage, and that goes on for 20 years and there's no symptoms at all. Now, what is the prodromal stage? We have antibodies to all of our tissue. That's normal. Now, why would you have antibodies to your thyroid or to the myelin that surrounds your nerves, the saran wrap around your nerves? Why would you do that? Uh, why would the body do that? Because you have to get, you have an entire new body every seven years, every cell in your body regenerates. And you have to get rid of the old and damaged cells to make room for new cells. Well, how do you do that? You do that by the immune system getting rid of the old and damaged cells that makes room for the new cells. And that includes antibodies antibodies to your thyroid, antibodies to the collagen on your joints, antibodies to the myelin around your nerves, antibodies to your brain tissues to get rid of the old and damaged cells. So when you do a blood test for thyroid, that's a common one as an example, and you see that the antibodies are in the normal range, and the range is usually somewhere between zero and 42, depends on the lab, sometimes 36, depends on the lab. So let's say you got 28 antibodies to your thyroid. That's in the normal range. What does that mean? It means you're making as many new cells as you're losing. So that's a good thing. But when you get elevated antibodies, you're killing off more cells than you're making. So we have a normal level of antibodies. That's on the left side of the screen here. And that's normal to have. But because of the lives we live, the things that we're exposed to that create inflammation in our bodies, whether it's to foods or it's to bacteria and viruses, or it's the air we're breathing, the environment or electromagnetic pollution or emotional stress, too many stress hormones or structural problems. They keep accumulating 
and we lose tolerance. And now you start making antibodies, more antibodies to the foods or the bacteria or the viruses. And they will grab onto your own tissue like your thyroid. You know, just Google BPA and thyroid and you'll see the studies come up how BPA grabs onto your thyroid and many other tissues. But then your body makes antibodies to destroy that BPA thyroid complex. Uh, so you damage that part of your thyroid where the BPA is grabbing onto it. Now you make more thyroid antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cells. And this is a self-perpetuating circle that includes. So you make more antibodies to your own tissue because of these six factors that are outlined here. And this goes on for 20 years or more, making these elevated antibodies. Now, once again, when it's elevated, you're killing off more cells than you're making. So now for 20 years, you're killing off brain cells in this example. You're killing off brain cells, but you don't feel it. You feel fine. You don't have any problems. You don't know it's happening, but it's going on. That's where the NeuroZoomer Plus comes in. It's such a great test because it identifies inflammation in the brain. 53 different markers of inflammation in the brain. So it doesn't matter how you feel. If you've got even one elevated, you've got a problem. And some doctors have said, well, you've only got three elevated. It's not so bad out of 53. Nonsense. You don't want any of them elevated. And quite honestly, we've never had anyone come back normal on a first test because everyone's exposed to this environment that we live in now and everyone's inflamed. And you may have heard me say before, our friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer's, uh, he tells us that 60 to 65% of all Alzheimer's is inhalation Alzheimer's. It's what you're breathing that goes straight up your nose, right to the memory center of your brain, causing the inflammation in your brain. And we're all breathing the same air. So we've never had anyone come back normal on a first test. Now they better be normal on follow-up tests uh, if you followed our protocols or better. They, you know, some people it takes two years to get it normal to stop all the inflammation killing off brain cells, but it better be better uh, if, we're, if you're doing what we recommend that you do. But everyone's got inflammation in the brain until they identify those triggers that are setting it off. So this goes on for over 20 years. Now you start getting some symptoms like, where did I park my car in the parking lot? Or where are my keys? Or what's the name of the person that's come in um, uh, uh, into the room just now? Or who's that walking? Oh, what's her name? What's her name? What's her name? and short-term memory loss. And as you see here, once again, these are the best scientists in the world that put this together. This goes on for seven years or more. So now you've got 25 to 30 years of this inflammation going on in your brain with first no symptoms and then mild symptoms, and then it progresses. Uh, uh, oh, one of the signs here, the bottom one that I circled is hyposmia. That's a reduction in your sense of smell. That that is the first indicator that you've got a problem in the memory center of your brain. It's not your nose uh, because these nerves called the olfactory nerves, they go right back into the memory center of the brain. And so when you're losing your sense of smell, you're not recognizing what you're smelling. You're, it's like a person walking down the street. You're not recognizing that person. You're not, what, what's their name? What's their name? What's their name? You're trying to come up with the name. So hyposmia is the first sign. That's why we put together the smell test that we did. And you see here, the URL, the dr.com forward slash smell. I put five studies there for you. You can download them and read them and you do an OMG about shortened lifespan when you're losing your sense of smell and early markers of a brain on fire and preclinical Alzheimer's and preclinical Parkinson's. You read these studies and you understand how important the sense of smell is and you order the test. It's a very inexpensive test. I think it's $49. And we'll put the link in here for you. You do the test, it's so simple. 
and you score it yourself right there at home. And then, you know, there's 12 different scents. You know, it's like a lottery card. You scratch it, you smell it. And then we ask you, what is this? And then you turn the page and you do it again. You do it 12 times and the answer sheet's right there. And if you score nine or below, you're losing your sense of smell. You better examine this and figure out what's going on. And then you get my book, You Can Fix Your Brain, and you start reading about where all of this inflammation and degeneration comes from, and you start to learn the process of living an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. That's the goal here. That's the big picture goal. But that's why I put the smell test here is because hyposmia is the early marker of a brain on fire one of the early symptoms that you can notice. And where I put the circle around the prodromal stage and mild cognitive impairment is because this is the easiest time to deal with this brain deterioration that's going on. I mean, you, you can make great headway um, if you address it here uh, because you still have a lot of the, uh, your brain cells are left. You know, you kill off some brain cells and you're starting to get some symptoms but you can arrest the development of this. You can stop the inflammation or reduce the inflammation. And fog cutter is an important part of that. Uh, and when you read the studies on fog cutter from the uh, handout that we'll give you the link to, you see, oh my gosh, look at this again and again and again and again, all the different studies that talk about the value of that. So from mild cognitive impairment, now you go to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And this is where there's a 407% increase in 30 to 44 year olds at this level from uh, according to Blue Cross Blue Shield. And now you understand this has been going on for 25 or 30 years already. Wow, 25 or 30 years. That means they were 10 years old and they already were on fire. Their brains up. Yeah, how many kids do you hear of that have attention deficit and they wanna put them on drugs? Or how many kids are on antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication. I mean, it's just a horrible statistic when you see what's happening to our children nowadays. And you realize that these young people diagnosed with mild Alzheimer's, they've had a problem for 25 or 30 years already. And now they say, well, what can I take to fix this? Well, you've got a bonfire going on in your brain and we have to put the fire out. You have to treat the fire, not the smoke. You know, the smoke are the symptoms. You know, yeah, but you've, you've got to put the fire out. So you have to stop throwing gasoline on the fire. And how do you do that? You have to read my book or uh, uh, start diving into our, our, our brain masterclass where I did all of these videos in four to nine minute videos, just one concept at a time. And I give you the, the exercises or the links. You know, here's the links to get glass storage containers. Get rid of the Tupperware because the, the chemicals in there leach into the food when you store it in the refrigerator overnight. And the next day you eat the chicken, but now it's got phthalates on it. Uh, and you, you, you say, what? And you just start learning all of these things uh, uh, and you start applying them. And then it progresses to moderate Alzheimer's and severe Alzheimer's. And uh, so to the answer to the question, how do we prevent Alzheimer's? Once you understand this graph, that came from the best scientists in the world because um, I know of two, and I'm sure there are more, pharmaceutical companies that closed their Alzheimer's research departments and laid off the scientists. They said, you know, we've spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on this research and we're never gonna find a drug for Alzheimer's. Let's apply our focus somewhere else where we can make more profit. I mean, that's the logic in a business that's designed for profit. They can't be just doing human good research and not get a return on their money. And I'm not defending pharmaceutical companies, but when they close their Alzheimer's research departments, you know there's a problem. And that's when Health and Human Services called this conference uh, uh, of the best minds in the world. And they said, well, this is what we're dealing with. There's never gonna be a pill to fix this. That's just impossible. You have to change the lifestyle that's creating all of this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and go back to um, the Q&As and see what the uh, 
next question is here. Can you take ash, uh, rhodiola and ashwagandha together? Absolutely, they're both a part of uh, fog cutter. They both are, and yes, you can. Now, there's such a difference between a company that says, oh, look, rhodiola is really good. Oh, look, ashwagandha is really good. Let's put them in a capsule together, and they mix them together. And that is uh, very basic. It's even below junior, it's infant level formulating of these incredible herbs that are on our planet. Uh, when the formulator at Sunhorse, and if you watch some of the videos on Sunhorse, or uh, we'll, we'll give you a link to a couple of videos here uh, of the formulator, uh, Dan Moriarty, and he talks about how do you put formulas together? Um, it takes a year to learn one herb. It takes a year. And you know, some people have, right, okay, well, yeah, I can always learn more. No, 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 it takes a year. Because if you harvest ginseng in the spring, the ginsenicides in ginseng, the ratios are very different than if you harvest it in the fall. So you have to learn a plant through all of its seasons to determine what are the benefits that you want out of using this plant. And that's the harvest that you want is by season to get what you need and what you want uh, to accomplish. And if you mix a number of herbs together, you can't just throw them in the pot and stir them up and cook them down and make your thing, that it makes a big difference which one you add because a couple of herbs, you know, if you add, let me see if I can come up with an analogy for you. Uh, if you add uh, butter into a pan at a low heat and soften the butter, and then you add flour in a little bit of time with a whisk and you're whisking it up, you know, then you're, you're making this like gravy. But if you, um, take flour and you just throw in some butter in there and try and mix it up, it's not going to work, right? There's, and I'm no Julia Child, and I think you can tell I'm not a Gordon Ramsay. I'm, I'm not a cook in any way, but I hope you get my point that there is a protocol to follow when you're trying to introduce herbs to each other uh, to give to a person. And in the world of herbs is called global resonance formulation. Global, meaning the big picture view of how these herbs resonate together. And what we've always said is, you know what, the Sun Horse Challenge. Take the herbs, give it a good two month trial. If you don't like it, let us know. We'll give you a refund, fine, no problem. You don't have to send it back, right? You know, uh, no questions asked. We've never had anybody ask for a refund because they, they work. They're, they're just the best. They work like none other I've ever seen. I'm the chief medical officer of Sunhorse. Uh, and some of you have heard the story of why, what happened with my mother. Uh, I won't go into the whole story, but I'll just say uh, she was in a coma and I flew home to Detroit. We were going to disconnect her. Hospice had said she won't wake up from this coma. She'd been in a coma for eight days. It was time to let her go. And I uh, flew home and got home late in, in the morning. Flights were late. So it was two in the morning when I went into the house, my sister's house, and our mom was there. And I go in the room, give my mom a kiss, and she's in a fetal position, her eyes half open. And I give her a kiss, and there's no recognition or nothing. And I said, Mom, hi, Mom, I'm here. But I said, why not? I just gave her some of my son horse. And I gave it to her a couple more times. And the next morning we had to leave for a meeting and we came back a few hours later and there's our mother in a wheelchair. And she goes, hi, 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 ta -ta Tom. And my sister started crying, you know, and I mean, we're just so startled. Uh, and our mom lived another six weeks, uh, just worn out, completely worn out from sepsis, but conscious, uh, rolled in the wheelchair to the kitchen table for meals and sat and smiled and talked a little bit. But I had flown home to pull the plug on the machine and Sunhorse brought her back. And that's what got me into Sunhorse because I knew what had happened. I don't know how it happened, 
but I knew because I really didn't know anything about adaptogens before that. But uh, I knew what had happened is that somehow these, these this product had turned on the genes of anti-inflammation and reduced the gene activity of inflammation in the brain. Uh, you know, you, you don't turn genes on and off. Genes operate on a dimmer switch, and you want to turn up the genes of anti-inflammation and turn down the genes of inflammation. That's the big goal, you know, and however you can do that, that's safe and effective and nothing does it like the adaptogens. Remember the three criteria, don't do any harm. It's not tissue specific, it's global. It helps everything, right, right? And uh, um, it balances. If you're too high, it brings you down. If you're too low, it brings you up. Those are the three criteria uh, for adaptogens. What's good for your gums? I have receding gums. Well, when you have receding gums, one of the contributing factors to that, there are a number, but a primary one is the environment the gums are in. That's your oral mucosa. That's the oral cavity, everything that's in here. You have over 800 different types of bacteria in the oral mucosa. You know, we swallow about a liter a day of saliva and the bacteria that live in our mouth, uh, that's what gets in the saliva and goes down into your gut. And when your gums are receding, you've got leaky gums. You know, it's like leaky gut and leaky brain, you get leaky gums. And so one of the things that we do and we recommend to everyone is first thing is change the oral mucosa. And the first thing you do for that is the toothpaste that you use. And we'll give you the link here for Dental Sidon and Dental Sidon LS. Uh, um, those are the products and Biosidon. Uh, so what I would recommend you start with and just do this for a couple of months if you didn't wanna do anything else, get the liquid Biosidon put a drop or two on your tongue a couple times a day and brush your teeth with the dental Sidon. It's a toothpaste, it tastes good. And it's an antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. And then a couple of pumps of the dental Sidon LS and swish it around and you do a oral wash and oral lavage by swishing it around like a mouthwash or something. Um, some people talk about doing it for five minutes or so. And I'm all for that. I don't, I, I don't have the patience to do that. I do it for about, oh, 10 to 15 seconds, but it is recommended you do it for a couple of minutes. Some people just keep the Biocide and LS in the shower. So when they're in the shower, they just give themselves a few pumps and they're swishing it around while they're shampooing and doing everything else. And they spit it out uh, and rinse out their mouth uh, while they're in the shower. Uh, but I changed the oral mucosa. That's the first thing you do for receding gums. And there are studies that show that coenzyme Q10 is really good for it. Uh, it's been helpful, but uh, it's not a deficiency of coenzyme Q10 that causes receding gums. It's the environment creating the inflammation in your mouth. And then you have to ask the question, where's the inflammation coming from, right? So you've got this environment in your mouth that's developed over time, but what are the foods? that are creating that inflammation. So there we go all, all back into everything you do for any chronic inflammatory disease. And the first thing we like to recommend is called the wheat zoomer. It's a blood test, the most comprehensive test available on wheat. And I know, cause I lecture all over the world and I look at the laboratories all over the world um, at the breaks in this. I was just in Dublin and London and Rome and, uh, uh, I look at the labs at, uh, at the break that are there for the doctors to come and see their services. Nothing compares to the wheat zoomer. It's the best test possible. So do the wheat zoomer to begin with uh, and find out uh, if you have a sensitivity to wheat and if you've got a leaky gut, which likely you do if you have receding gums. Um, and uh, you, you start there. But reading my book, Oh, here's my book. I actually have a copy here. You can fix your brain. That's the book. And I did the uh, 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 audio on this myself. It's the, oh, you can't see it. Oh, I see. Uh, 
maybe it, get, it focuses now more clearly. I'm seeing on my phone, there it goes. Okay, okay. Uh, my phone is about four seconds behind the live and I saw that it was blurry uh, on the phone. I did the audio for the book and it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It was four, eight to 10 hour days where every sentence you have to be conscious. You can't be thinking about lunch. You know, I gotta stay focused on what you're reading. Uh, but I'm very proud of it. It's a great book and it's in, an, I think it's 11 languages now. And, uh, it's just a great book and uh, lots of accolades and notes of thanks that come through um, on, on the book. Okay. Um, hi, Dr. Tom, I have three questions. This is Eileen on Zoom. Are there any concerns with using any of the adaptogens with autoimmunity, uh, rheumatoid? No, not, not that I'm aware of. Ashwagandha, which is a nightshade. Um, really good line of thinking. Uh, I have never seen a problem with our rheumatoid patients using Sunhorse products. I've never seen it. And uh, I've had a lot of autoimmune cases that I've recommended it to. I've never seen a problem. Uh, the concept of nightshades with arthritis is a valid one. Uh, nightshades are the family of potatoes and eggplant and okra. Uh, uh, and they, there are components in the nightshades that can cause, they, that have a, a molecular mimicry with your joints. And so they can cause inflammation in the joints and that's valid. Uh, but I've not seen a problem with ashwagandha, especially uh, the high quality uh, products uh, such as what we have. I've never seen it. It may be the case. Uh, I'm unaware uh, of that one though, but that's a really good line of thinking for a question. I've read conflicting reports on mushrooms that they shouldn't be used as they may stimulate an already overactive immune system. What are your thoughts? Really good question. Um, um, there is a concept of uh, building your immune system. How do you support an immune system when you're dealing with an immune related condition? And now from the slides I showed you earlier that systemic chronic inflammation is the cause of 14 of the 15 top causes of death death in the world is systemic chronic inflammation. That means it's always an active, overactive immune system that's causing the problem. Without exception, it's always an overactive immune system. Now, there are some products that uh, are like putting jet fuel in a Volkswagen. And you don't want to do that uh, if you're driving an old Volkswagen, you don't want to demand that engine work a lot harder than it's capable of working. Um, so it's always better to titrate up a product. But I've seen so many benefits with mushrooms. And the mushroom products that are in the, uh, the mushroom components that are in the Sunhorse products are balanced in there. There's... Uh, We've never seen a problem ever. And we've got thousands and thousands of people that have used these products. Uh, so it's certainly possible at any time that anyone can have a reaction to anything. Uh, but that's a very valid question, Eileen, about uh, 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 mushrooms in general. Uh, I, but I've not seen that be an issue with the Sunhorse products ever. Uh, Mary asked, do adaptogens help with sleep? Absolutely, they can. Yes, especially if REM and deep sleep are the issues. Yes, they can, because if, you're, if, if REM and deep sleep are the issue, it's, um, I'm going to use a term here, and it's not quite accurate, but for a concept, your brain's too, it's got too much anxiety. It's too on. It's not calming down. And the job of adaptogens, if you're too high, it's to bring you down. If you're too low, it's to bring you up. It's to bring balance. So yes, absolutely they can help. And for that, I would use, um, there are three different products you could use. I think the first one that I would consider is called Kava Lift, K-A-V-A, -A, Kava Lift. Uh, uh, but the second one would be uh, Ultimate Energy. And it sounds like energy, well, I don't want more. No, Ultimate Energy is what brought my mother out of a coma. 
And we have seen so many miracle testimonials over the years, reversing macular degeneration. I mean, I'm startled by what these people write in to say has happened for them. We had a medical doctor who was, went with um, Doctors Without Borders to help after a typhoon really devastated Sri Lanka um, 12 years ago, something like that. And she caught dengue fever. And it was the first case of dengue fever, I guess, in, uh, after a typhoon in Sri Lanka. And it was so bad, uh, she couldn't work. And she went to some famous viral clinic in France. They couldn't help her. She went to a couple good famous clinics in the US. They couldn't help her. And she was, wasn't unable to work anymore. And a friend gave her a bottle of ultimate energy. And within two months, um, she was back to work part time. And within three or four months, she was back to work again. And she wrote us a really nice letter. This was a number of years ago. And it just dropped our jaw. So I did a little research on that. There's 30 million people a year that get dengue fever. And I thought, oh, my gosh, wow, what a market if we could you know, learn how to market this properly to that group. So the doctors would give it a try with their dengue fever patients. And we haven't been successful at that. Uh, but um, uh, uh, that, that's just another testimonial that came in. Uh, so ultimate energy is the one that I would use in terms of the adaptogens for Kava Lift. What is a good study to show that high fat diet keto isn't good after two years? plus for gut permeability, fat transporting toxins and autoimmune. You mentioned it in your practitioner course, right? And uh, uh, Marnie is from Marnie on Instagram. Marnie, if you're in the practitioner course, send a message to them and they'll find the study for you. Uh, on that one, I don't, I'm not, uh, I've seen a couple of studies in the last month or two uh, that were referencing the high fat diets and the complications of chronic intestinal permeability, leaky gut, which is the gateway in the development of all autoimmune diseases. But I don't have them on the tip of my brain to tell you those studies. But if you're in the practitioner course, um, we'll find the studies for you. And thank you for being part of that program. And for those of you who don't know, we have a certified gluten-free practitioner course. And we'll put the link in here for you uh, for that. Um, it's just the bad, I'm so proud of it. And we've had um, thousands now uh, that have benefited from that. So you might want to consider the course if you want an in-depth study and look at uh, in-depth training and course study after study. There's over 300 studies in that one. What uh, from Jill on Facebook? What do you know about the effectiveness of psilocybin? Oh, they're really effective. Uh, uh, there's a number of studies, Jill, that talk about that now. And uh, uh, Sunhorse has been uh, experimenting with uh, some of those concepts of helping with, uh, and we've had some really good results with PTSD uh, with some army vets, uh, actually quite dramatic results. And uh, there's a couple of different uh, uh, practitioners and in their clinics, they're working to see um, how this works. But, um, there's a lot of credibility of this concept of microdosing, uh, so as not to alter one's consciousness, but just to kind of tune, tune in a little bit more to a, uh, a balanced uh, brain function. It's, it, they're, they're impressive, uh, the studies that have come out on this. Which Zoomer would be most beneficial in addition to Neural Zoomer Plus for suspected lupus with negative ANA? Um, for every autoimmune condition, we always recommend the wheat zoomer because it also um, it has includes the most comprehensive test for leaky gut. And for every autoimmune disease, the gut is the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. So the first one would be the wheat zoomer. The second one, the neural zoomer plus the third one would be the gut zoomer. Um, to find out what's your microbiome like, because that's where you have to focus. With every autoimmune disease, you must include a focus on rebuilding a healthy microbiome. So if you don't know where the deficiencies are in the microbiome to begin with, then you don't know how to focus 
your protocols to rebuild because, well, it's out of balance. So, so okay, how, how are you going to rebuild? Well, I don't know. We'll just shotgun. And I give recommendations to rebuild a healthy gut, global recommendations um, such as bone broth and uh, applesauce and a number of other things that we talk about. They're global, but when you do the gut zoomer, you find out specifically where the problems are. You have bacterial infections, you, you got to get rid of the bad bacteria, right? But you don't shotgun that into everyone. You um, have to be target specific. So the test would be wheat zoomer, neural zoomer plus, and gut zoomer. Uh, and most people find out that it's not just one food, not just wheat, uh, but they find dairy, uh, as a problem, and there are a number of Zoomers. That's why the lab has put together these packages that you can um, order of a number of Zoomers and save hundreds of dollars is because you don't want to just, just look at wheat. I think that's the top priority because it's the most common, but also dairy is really common. Uh, for some people, eggs or corn are very common, so you uh, might want to do a number of Zoomers. Do digestive enzymes help with any of this and which do you recommend that are compatible to prescribe? And this is from Sean Quilo on Facebook. Digestive enzymes are critical. I'm writing a paper right now on um, um, the gluten-free diet is not the treatment for celiac disease. It's the prerequisite to treatment for celiac disease and any other gluten-related disorder, that the uh, concept of um, uh, contamination in your food is extremely high. There are many papers on this that show 35% uh, uh, of everything on a gluten-free menu is not gluten-free in a restaurant. That's like startling. It's like, what? What? What did you just say? And at Columbia University, very famous celiac research center, they sent 804 people out into the community with testing equipment. And they asked them to go into uh, restaurants and order off the gluten-free menus. So that's 5,624 foods because they all were asked to order seven different foods. Seven times 804 is 5,624. They found that 32% of everything they ordered was not gluten-free. One third of everything was not gluten-free. 51%, I think it was 51 point something percent of gluten-free pizza was not gluten-free. 54% of gluten-free pasta was not gluten-free. And this is in gluten-free restaurants. So you think you're safe and you're not because it's contamination. So you must take the digestive enzymes to protect yourself. This is a primary reason why over 50% of celiacs, 12 years on a strict gluten-free diet still have villous atrophy, meaning their gut still chewed up. 12 years on a gluten-free diet. I read that paper and I said, what, what? That's why you have to take the enzymes to protect yourself. And there's two enzymes that work really well. Uh, one is called E3 Advance Plus. The other is called Wheat Rescue. We'll give you the links for both. Uh, if you have gut symptoms of any type, use the E3 Advance Plus because it also has bacteriophages in it. These are good guy viruses that go after bad bacteria in your gut. Uh, but if you don't have gut symptoms, you've got brain symptoms or joint symptoms or skin symptoms, then use Wheat Rescue because it has a few more extra digestive enzymes in it. But they both digest over 99% of any inadvertent exposures to gluten or actually the top eight food allergens, dairy, egg, soy, uh, uh, shellfish, peanuts, and fish, uh, over 99%. And here's the critical part, within 60 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes, fish was longer, it took 90 minutes. Why? I don't know. I don't know why, but it did. But within 60 to 90 minutes, and that's really important because the food comes out of the stomach into the first part of the intestines between 90 minutes and three hours. Uh, it goes into the intestine and that's where the sentries are standing guard. 
that if you eat something that's really a problem for you, uh, uh, then the centuries standing guard in the first part of the small intestine activate leaky gut and they activate the inflammatory cascade, all the inflammation. That's where it happens. So you have to digest these inadvertent exposures to foods before they go out of the stomach. And all of the gluten enzymes out there take three to six hours to work. Uh, they work, but they don't work in an acid environment. So they don't work in the stomach. So that means you eat something and it's got some inadvertent exposure to wheat. And what happens is, uh, oh, we got geo. Time out. I'll, I'll come back to all of this. But for the moment, we've got geo. Come here, you. Oh, yes. So let's see here. Oh, oh, well, Gio can only see me on the screen because he can't see all of you out there. Uh, so, so he's a little bored. Oh, oh, he wants a drink of my blueberry drink. Yes. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those of you who were asking, I saw, I said, where's Gio? Where's Gio? Well, thank you for asking. And here he is. Here he is. Okay. Night, night, Gio. Night, night, little boy. Okay, let me give you the mommy. Here you go. Now I'm going to plug the headset back in so that you can hear me okay. Just one moment while I do that. Good, 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 good. And I saw a couple of questions there. Geo did great in the travels through Europe. You know, he just... Uh, these eight hour and 10 hour flights where we were concerned that might be a problem, but he's just a trooper, just hung out on mommy's breast and was just breastfeeding and just hanging out there and just wanted to snuggle on the plane. And then on the flight back, uh, he's walking up and down the aisle looking for going, hi, hi. And just like this, and everyone loved it. As a matter of fact, we were in a uh, we flew back on Saturday and uh, we were in a health food store uh, um, uh, on Sunday. And this woman says, oh, you were on the plane. And this, this is in a beach town, maybe four hours from uh, the airport. Uh, yeah, I remember your son. And so uh, he's, he's um, quite the hit. Uh, it was great. It was just great. What a beautiful little boy. Uh, privilege to be his father, real privilege. Okay, so the enzymes, it's wheat rescue or uh, um, E3 advanced plus. And you, you just take them before every meal, you take them before you start eating. So nothing gets through into the first part of the intestine that hasn't gone past these digestive enzymes. That's really important. Okay, time's up, really? Wow, that's really quick. Uh, well, I'm going to do two more questions because I feel like we're just getting started. So can super sensitivity to smells be also a sign of inflammation? Yes. Yes, it can. Uh, do adaptogens help with someone needing help with insomnia? Yes, they do. If you're too high, they bring you down. If you're too low, they bring you up. Oh, we, we talked about that one already, right? What if you are already 73 years? What can we do if we have no obvious symptoms? <laughs> Colin, great question, Colin. Well, I'm 70 and you just saw what I can do. You know, excuse me, but you know, uh, uh, there, your body always wants to be healthier. You, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell regenerates. As we get older, they move a little slower uh, in regeneration, but they still regenerate. And I got to tell you, um, I think for elders, the adaptogens, the Sunhorse products are more important than for younger people. If I, if I was asked that question, which one's more important, I would say for elders, because they notice the results a lot quicker. Uh, men are supposed to wake up with an erection. That's normal. Testosterone is supposed to be the highest first thing in the morning so men can go out hunting and get the food. They need their energy to go out there and hunt our ancestors. So it's normal to do that. And if you're not waking up um, uh, that way, then uh, you want to take the men's product is called Mojo 8.5.
and its ultimate energy, plus a few extra herbs adaptogens for men. And for women, the product is called Thrivagen for thriving, uh, which is ultimate energy, plus a few extra products for women balancing hormones. And we've had great results with perimenopausal women and the symptoms that they have. They consistently notice that the symptoms are greatly reduced. They feel more balanced. Uh, the night sweats stop, uh, um, all of that. Roberta says, hello from Brazil. Hello, Roberta, I'll be in Brazil. I'm teaching uh, in the end of November in Sao Paulo, uh, but in any event. When a patient already has Alzheimer's, is it possible to work on his brain inflammation using those techniques? Yes, of course. Uh, but if the patient is already diagnosed with Alzheimer's, these techniques are essential, essential. Uh, there's no other way to arrest or slow down the progression of that disease. And that's where our friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen and his book, The End of Alzheimer's, he, he wrote so clearly, and he's got over a hundred cases that he published on, he's got many more, but he published on over a hundred cases of reversing uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, so yes, it's certainly possible. And I would recommend you read his book um, so that, because when someone's already diagnosed, you don't want to just put your toe in the water. You want to dive in deeply. Uh, have you ever heard of using adaptogens for dogs? Oh, absolutely. A any animal. They love it. They just love the ultimate energy. I'm, um, the horses, uh, and, you know, the name Sun Horse comes because the founder has a couple of these Spanish horses that were the first horses brought to the U.S. Um, hundreds of years ago. Uh, they're Palomino color. I don't remember the name of the horse, but that's the logo is that horse. And the horses love Sun Horse. And when they don't give them Sun Horse for a couple of days, the, the, startling, the horses will eat their feces from a day ago or two days ago because the residue of the herbs are in the feces. I've never seen such a thing. Never seen that before. Never heard of it before. But animals aren't stupid. You know, they, they know what's good for them. And many, many cases, really aggressive cats that no one can go near. You put Sun Horse in with their food and they calm down in a few days to a week. And dogs, the same way. So absolutely, you can use these products on your animals. Absolutely, without hesitancy. All right, folks, I've gone over uh, almost 10 minutes and uh, uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, I see there are more questions. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to some of them uh, at the beginning of next week. Uh, I will see you again the same time next week. Thank you very much for being here.